Hello, and you're very welcome to The Week That Really Was with John McGurk and Sarah Ryan. It is Friday the 24th of November, 2023. It's an interesting edition of the podcast this week for back the reason that Sarah and I actually recorded this yesterday on the 23rd of November at about one o'clock in the afternoon before um, Dublin went mad after a terrible incident. Um, so just for the benefit of listeners, for the first 25 minutes or so, you're going to listen to Sarah and I talking on Friday. Um, because we we thought it was important enough, this being a weekly show, to discuss what actually happened yesterday. And then after that's over, you'll hear our original podcast, which was recorded yesterday. Some of that podcast is a little bit light. It's a little bit jolly in tone. Um, That's why I didn't want people thinking, Sarah, that we were laughing and joking while something terrible was ongoing, because we weren't. We hadn't happened at that stage. How are you? All right. Um, Yeah. So normally we record the podcast on Thursday, late Thursday evening. And uh, it was one, the one week we saw, I made plans to go out for dinner with my husband. We recorded at one o'clock in the afternoon and then the absolute shit show has happened. So, yeah, um, I'm a bit I'm, I'm 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 a bit disturbed, to be honest. Explain uh, what has you disturbed? What has me disturbed is really we can get to other bits of this later. But as you know, I drop or I pick up kids from school every day and. What happened yesterday in Parnell Street is quite literally the stuff of my nightmares. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, like when you collect kids from school or my kids could still do this thing where, you know, they stand in a line, they they fist pump or they high five the teacher when they see their parent. But it's very chaotic and, you know what I mean, people and running everywhere and kids everywhere, whatever. So when I project this horrifying, horrifying scene onto that, it is quite literally just the stuff of, of, of nightmares. I, and and to be honest, and I will admit that this is, you know, prob- probably massively naive on my part. And we and I'm prefacing, I'm going to preface this by saying like, we don't know the motives. We don't know what the situation is. But that kind of violence, if it's if it's what it looks like, which is that it's random. It always felt to me like something that just didn't happen in Ireland. And, and, and I appreciate that that's probably naivety on my part, but, and I'm not saying that violence against children and violence doesn't happen in Ireland. Of course it does, but that kind of random thing, you know, you'd see things in London and Paris and, and for me, it's just a real dead moment in, 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 in my life where like, it's, I'm frightened. I'm, I found it really frightening yesterday that that could happen, that that has happened. Yeah. I mean, yeah. That there's a poor child, really almost exactly smack bang in the middle of or at the same age. So there's three kids involved, as far as I understand, nearly exactly the age of my two boys. And I find the idea that some mother somewhere right now is in a hospital, you know, at the bedside of their child who was stabbed like this, just so unbelievably distressing. Yeah, I mean, for me, it strikes me... There are obviously, and there have been awful incidents in Ireland involving children. Um, there have been a couple of incidents of what the police refer to as, or the Guardian refer to as family destruction murders. I'm thinking of the Hall case in County Cavan a few years ago where the, the husband murdered his wife and his three children. Um, but that those, were, those weren't random. Um, they were horrifying, but it wasn't attacking somebody else's oh. child. Of course, and they bring their own. The mother who killed the three children, the father is, has, is on Twitter. Um, yes. That, again, that kind of thing is the stuff of nightmares. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not kind of, <laughs> I'm not diminishing that by in any way. But the random acts are yeah. I'm not, I'm not, uh, yeah, to be clear, I'm not disagreeing with you. What I'm saying is that this was, I mean... I think most people, maybe naively, believe that they're safe in their own family homes, um, and in those isolated incidences, they weren't. But this is this wasn't in somebody's family home. This is on the street. It was apparently, and I, I, I want to stress, Sarah, the word apparently, because the Guardian are not. There was some talk, some chatter yesterday that it may, he may not have been unknown to to the to the female victim in particular, the adult female victim. Um, we don't know exactly. We don't. We we, we don't know. The Guardi. I I can tell you at that one stage yesterday afternoon, the Guardi were were unclear about that themselves, and I haven't seen a definitive statement either way. But it, I think the position appears to be the emerging consensus is that it was a random attack, and that's that's terrifying. It reminded me. Um, 
And it reminded me a lot. Do you remember last year in France? I think it was in Annecy in the south of France. Uh, and there's so many of these in France that they 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 kind of get merged into kind of general sense of attacks in France. But this one was particularly horrifying where uh, a young man went around a playground stabbing toddlers. Do you remember that? Oh, God. Yeah. You do. It, it, it had that kind of, that's what it reminded me of. Now, it's up to the Gardaí to investigate. I'm sure that's one angle they'll be investigating. Um, they said yesterday that their initial their initial indication was that it wasn't a terror attack, for example, but they also didn't rule it out. They're still investigating that. We don't know why he did it, um, but we know that he did it. And that in by itself is horrifying. And, you know, we got in huge trouble yesterday. When I say we got in huge trouble, I want to emphasize that we got in huge trouble with a certain section of the country for reporting the factual information, which we sourced very carefully, that the man who carried out this assault um, was born in Algeria and came to Ireland. Um, but I think the the reaction to it is not only about immigration. I think it's also about the sort of breakdown of law and order in the city centre, which you and I have talked about for a long time. But now uh, it's OK. But that's, uh, I mean, exactly. There's a massive problem with that in the city centre. But like months ago, you were being gassed and told that didn't exist. Yeah, we were. I mean, this is this 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 incident happened in broad daylight in the middle of the street. And by the way, we obviously we want to pay tribute to the various individuals who intervened to stop this man because the guardie weren't there to stop it. Uh, now the guardie can't be everywhere. That's not a criticism, but they weren't there. Yeah. But lives were saved by. Oh no! Uh, like real, I loved the whole. It was just such a kind of a testament to Dublin you know the delivery driver like the bravery of that is just unbelievable like he's just what a what an amazing human being and then the woman coming across from the start just just like like all these real like I just the characters of Dublin coming together and 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 doing this amazing yeah, uh, there is, and I think it's important that there's a good news story in there. I mean, there is, like, there's a, there's a sense that there is still community there, and there is still social solidarity. Nothing has completely broken down. I mean, because no. these people intervened to 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 save people. The, the delivery driver's name is, uh, and I, please, if we have Brazilian, yeah, I'm uh, afraid because I can't pronounce it. Yet. Well, if oh. I if I mispronounce Kiao Benicio's name, then uh, please somebody tell me, and I'll correct it next week. But Kiao Benicio is his name. Uh, he's from Brazil. He's a delivery driver. Um, do you know what's really interesting, actually, that he's from Brazil, where and I have no idea, I'm speculating wildly here, but uh, in Brazil, they, they teach a form of martial, martial arts called capoeira, one of the principles of which is that if somebody is, and this is just good public service information, if somebody's attacking you with a knife, you it's almost impossible to stop them with your hands because you will, the, your hands will be yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So you, you basically need to find a blunt object, any kind of weapon, that's and and attack with that to protect your hands. Uh, so he he used his motorcycle helmet to literally beat the person into submission. And then there was the the other the other fantastic bunch of characters. I think there was an American woman involved. In yeah, kind I think of because so. there was an angry mob, and I completely understand the sentiments of the angry mob, which which surrounded the attacker on the ground. I mean, there were literally little girls injured who just been stabbed. So one might understand the tempers are running high. But there were there were a couple of women who surrounded the attacker on the ground who said were are reported to have said, look, this is not how we do things in Ireland. We're going to wait for the Guardi. Um and those women, I think, did a very admirable thing as well. Yeah. Um anyway, let's talk about the riots. So I mean <laughs> like I, I feel like you're kind of you're in this position now and 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 I and, and I I'm in a number of WhatsApp groups and which became all of them really became heated in different ways last night when this was going on because I feel like if you say one thing people will say you're so you're advocating burning the city to the ground obviously not and if you say something else you're saying oh it's okay for people to stab kids it's like everybody needs to kind of relax for a second and say it's possible for us all as intelligent human beings to hold two seemingly contradictory thoughts in our heads at the same time. There is a problem with law and order in the city centre. There is loads of have a go heroes who get involved. It happened years ago. Um, I remember this the, the, when they smashed up Nassau Street and everything years and years ago. 
Mm-hmm. The people who will just get involved in smashing the place up or whatever. Smashing up shops and the Lewis and setting fire to things has absolutely nothing to do and does not no, no benefit to anybody or anything. And and because of that, I was really struck this morning when I was listening to Claire Byrne. And Claire Byrne, had, you know, it was, it's obviously a topic all over the radio this morning. Uh, how long it took for a conversation to happen about what about what happened to these children? Mm-hmm. Now, however, I think the Guardi, like attacking your the Guardi, attacking the city is like you, you, the, you can't you can't say anything but that that is reprehensible behaviour. It, it is it is what it is, but th- th- there is an element not not the ones who are smashing up Foot Locker and stealing and looting and all that nonsense. There is an element of frustration that is growing within our society that is problematic and that the government are ignoring. Yeah, I, I couldn't disagree with anything you said there. I was talking to a Garda press officer last night who shall remain obviously nameless, but um, sort of reviewing the day's events with them. Mm. And one of the things they said to me, which I thought was notable, was that the Garda sort of, um, on one level, I want to be careful how I phrase this in case I get the Garda and their press officer in trouble, but on one level they consider it a success in that nobody got killed yesterday. Yeah. As of today, when we're recording, and I want to stress, we're recording this podcast at 12.30 in the afternoon on the 24th of November. So if this changes, uh, that's why I'm saying this. But as, as of the time we're speaking, nobody has died, thankfully. Um, even the children, although they're in a grievous condition and will probably be scarred for life mentally and physically, um, nobody has died. Um, so the, that, that's, that's, that, that's one thing to say. That is not to excuse the violence that went on yesterday. I was struck by Fatima Gunning, who has been on this podcast for and is just a stellar reporter because Fatima has something um, that very few reporters have, which is absolute balls of steel. She was on O'Connell Street last night. I saw. She, uh, she was in the middle of these scenes and she said that, for example, one of the things that was happening was people were clashing with riot police and the riot police would push back, and then the entire crowd would turn and stampede in the opposite direction. And she said, like, she was literally like Simba in The Lion King when the buffalo herd is coming. She was hiding behind the lamppost not to get trampled. So she was there, and um, she at one stage she was very nearly hit by a firework, and I think another member of my team, my cameraman, was hit by a firework. Um, so it was brutal. But she was there, and she was on the ground. And she said that, Basically, what happened was that there was a protest. There was a protest called for six o'clock in the evening at the Spire. There was also some incredibly incendiary rhetoric on Telegram and uh, other spaces where a couple of head the balls spend their time um, encouraging like aggro with the cops. But it started Mm -hmm. off initially small. And then when the basically when the first fireworks started being set off, uh, that drew in every maniac in the city centre. And like, uh, uh, you know, it's fairly obvious, you know, you can be far right and have strong um, views on immigration and even you know, the overthrow of the state, for all I know. Um, or you can just be somebody out who fancies new shoes. And I think I think there was a, probably a mixture of those two elements. But I think disproportionately, as the night grew into people who just wanted new shoes um, and could fancy getting them cheap by smashing in windows. I, I think that happens in every every situation. You saw it. In the US with the Black Lives Matter riots, you see it every other day of the week in Paris and France. Um, so I think the the narrative that this was a purely sort of far right thing is in the first instance a bit misleading. I think it probably started off that way, but it grew into something much bigger. I think that's sort of the impression certainly that Fatima got from being in the crowd. Yeah. And the impression I got from watching, frankly. And um, also the age, the age profile of some of the people I saw in videos was quite young, like you know, they're not politically radicalised. They're just the, you know, problematic people who've been in the city centre for the last couple of years that we've talked about on this podcast that make this, have made the city unsafe. You know, like the guy who was coming from the theatre, I can remember he was rounded on by absolute scumbags in town who, remember he was beaten I don't, up. I, I actually don't remember it, but, but there have been so many cases. Well, there was, okay. There was, so, there was a, f- a, f- a period there about six months ago, maybe less, where you and I discussed week on week, there was a number of high profile incidents in the city centre. Um, actually, where, I, I do remember the case you're talking about now. It's just come back to me. I do remember it. Um, and, but yeah, 
yeah there were and this element and 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 you know there was kind of a lots of thoughts and prayers and lots of hand wringing and then calls for more guardy or whatever and listen i'm not going to say whether or not more guardy were patrolling the city center and i didn't i was i don't spend enough time in town to make a call on that but i was saying as well that like when i went into um the king's inns and henrietta street and stuff like last year the year before and definitely after COVID, the city centre had deteriorated massively. That was a conversation that was happening and it was considered to be appalling and far right to call it out. And now I see a lot of people really like what would have been considered quite far right language about the background and socioeconomic status of some of these people on social media. Like, yeah, I- you know, like the language that's that I've, I've, I've seen on Twitter today by people obviously I won't name but I was kind of struck by God if you were saying that a few weeks ago about the guy who was beaten up and that these people were this that and the other you would have been absolutely yeah. cancelled but now it's okay because we're moving to it's a different thing and I just think people have a kind of an a la carte approach to what is and isn't okay yeah the, a few weeks ago the people rioting in the city centre last night were just uh, you know troubled youths in deprived areas that had a crime problem. And now they are, in the words of the, the Minister for Justice, far right thugs. So yeah. it's, uh, it's uh, yeah, you're right. There's there's a there's a degree to which flags of convenience are applied here. And there's also a degree to which like there is just rank hypocrisy. I mean, mm-hmm. first of all, like I have, I've, I, what I've had it with, because there was obviously an element last night of people being frustrated over immigration. And what I have had it with is the, is, 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 is this nonsense of, you know, people protested peacefully, Sarah, in East Wall for months and they were ignored and they were called far right and they were called the dregs of society and they were called bigots and they were Let's called... Let's call it what it is. Let's call it what it is. Racist. They're all racist. Yes. You had you had women across the country um, in places like Drimna and and Salins and, you know, Listu and Varda, you name it, going on camera and saying... We are concerned about the safety of women and children in our area because you are importing a whole load of men into an area that has no amenities for those men. Um, and we are concerned, frankly, that that might have an impact in our state, on our safety in the long term or the short term. Bigots, you know, disgraceful, you know, shut up. We don't want to hear you. We're going to do this anyway. Um, and you do it anyway. People talk about an eruption of violence. I mean, every time people have tried to do this, or express their views in a peaceful way, the establishment in this country with the full connivance of the media has said, you know, go away, we don't want to listen to you. Um, but, also, but also even at its most base level, you know, is, and like even, the, even the, the, you can't, like some of those people will be racist, John. Yeah. Like some of those people will be, but some won't. And that's the, the job of politics and, 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 you know, getting people creating a country that has some unity is is to talk to those people it's not to like it doesn't we're now at this point where shunning those people and calling them names and and ignoring them and not listening to them and you know making them this kind of like outcast from society isn't working like it simply has failed as, a, as an idea so now we have to talk about okay so what next now we're going to have to have conversations with people that are difficult that's politics yeah that's being the minister for justice or the minister for foreign affairs. Hard conversations where you talk to people that whose opinions you don't like. That's well, it. Like, that's what's that's what's needed. The, there's there's always going to be elements of horrible, racist, terrible people in in countries. There's also going to be people who are just frightened who just need to be talked to. But you have to try and bring these people together. Yeah. And I I just feel like the government and, and the media in this country have just started have this developed this pattern, whether it's COVID or whatever, of us and them, and just allowing themselves to not ever have to listen or engage with people they don't like. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. I was watching, I saw a clip of Prime Time last night um, where the Minister for Justice was speaking and she looked like she was in a bunker. I'm sure she was, <laughs> but it had that atmosphere of kind of like there was kind of a, a harsh yellow lighting and she was in this room and she was speaking and she looked a bit shaken up and she looked like she was in a bunker somewhere uh, trying to weather out the, the coup, basically. And I just thought, like, what, what are we doing here? This woman has failed miserably in her job. I'm sorry, if you are if you are the government of a country and the city centre is in flames, this is Ireland, by the way. It's not like we have weak, a weekly culture of riots like the French do. This is Ireland. This stuff does not happen very often. 
And the, the city centre is in flames. And a large section of the population have lost all faith in your ability to police the city uh, or to keep them safe or that you're listening to them. I think, what are you doing? Get, resign. Yeah, she's doing herself no good. She's doing the country no good. And frankly, not just her, but the, but the whole shagging government. I, I don't know what they're doing. Um, so, I mean, I, I just I just think, I mean, what, what strikes you're me... Dog, you're just a far-right dog, Mr. John. Yeah, well, what, what strikes me is, this is, you know, this is the thing. What strikes me is I'm listening to them this morning and I'm listening to the, to the waffle and the platitudes. And it sounds to me, it doesn't sound like any kind of conversation with the country. It is the usual in-group establishment group therapy session where we'll all talk ourselves into believing this was an isolated incident that could have been prevented if there had been better policing. Um, it could have been prevented if we cracked down on the far right. Do you know what the problem with these people is? They cannot figure out that it is not the far right fueling anti-immigration sentiment in Ireland. It is anti-immigration sentiment fueling the far right. The, the problem is growing because of the government's actions. It is not as if all of a sudden, I'm going to name some of these people, Derek Blyg down in Cork or or, or Philip Dwyer on Telegram, um, suddenly became flavour of the week with a huge section of the population. It is that nobody else is addressing the views that loads and loads of people have. Um, so, so you know, oh, we've got to stop the growth of the far right. If you want to stop the growth of the far right in this country... Put some controls on the border. Stop putting thousands of people into villages around the country, um, where you know the where the people living there do not want that to happen. Stop shouting every time your own citizens say we don't want this, but with the the single transferable answer of oh we have international obligations because you don't. That's a lie. It is a it is a blatant, barefaced, legal lie. This country does not have an unlimited international obligation to take as many people who want to come here. Um, and the public can see that. And they're getting angrier and they're getting angrier and they're getting angrier. And then eventually when it boils over, oh, it's disgraceful, they're so good, it's far right. I mean, resign. That's all I'll say about that. Well, I think if you're sitting here today and you are on either side and you think that everything that happened yesterday happened because of immigration, immigrants, you're absolutely wrong and racist. And if you're sitting here thinking everything that happened yesterday happened because of the far right, you're also wrong and an idiot. Correct. Correct. Um, there's it, it, it's got multitudinal factors, but we have a we have a media with and a, and a political establishment that can only see one problem. Anyway, Sarah, I think we'll 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 leave it there. What comes next is the podcast that we recorded yesterday. Um, let's hope that this is now seem, of, which now what? seems just, which now seems just kind of bizarre. Well, you know, uh, people can keep listening. There is some stuff in there that's actually relevant to this topic around Ryan Casey and other things. But um, anyway, okay. there's also also some stuff about how how bad you I don't am. Clean at how, how bad I am at housework. So keep <laughs> listening. All right, talk to you later. Bye. Hello and welcome everybody to the week that really was with John McGurk and Sarah Ryan. It is the 23rd of November, 2023. Um, it is, I think, at this stage when we're recording, it is just about oh thirty odd hours to the toy show. Sarah, how are you set? Oh my God, the toy show is an absolute nightmare. My kids only became aware of it last year and it was a hellscape of trying to keep them up till nine o'clock while they were like absolutely strung out on sugar. And then they watched it for about nine minutes and then were like crashed and it was hell. So I was hoping that I would get away with t t like telling them that it, that, that it had changed to a Saturday morning program. But the school have started this whole thing where they can all wear their pyjamas and bring a toy tomorrow in advance of the toy show tomorrow. Oh, for the love of God. So now I have to find pyjamas that are suitable for them to wear to school and a toy and do the toy show tomorrow night. So. Uh, I'm going, I was a curmudgeon last week of putting up the Christmas tree. I'm going to be a curmudgeon this week as well. Schools should teach kids maths and writing and reading and shouldn't be interfering and stuff like that. Um, I know it's like and they all love it and whatever, but it must be a nightmare for parents. I think the best thing about not being a parent is I don't have to watch the toy show and will not watch it. Uh, like, yeah. yeah, like, I, I, but I don't even think, like, I think that what you, what is it, two hours or something? I think that, like, I think that what you actually get on, like, social media is enough, as in you get the highlights and otherwise you're sitting through a lot of boring kind mm. of, you know, pantomime stuff that's not my cup of tea, my kids aren't interested. And, you know, I'm not really inclined for them to be exposed to some toy that will be sold out within three minutes and then that's all they want for the rest of Christmas. I just yeah. remember being, I remember being a kid and watching it as a kid and like and I'm not talking about today's children 
I'm not, I'm not being mean about children, but the people I'm talking about have now all grown up. But I remember watching it as a kid thinking the last thing I ever want to be in my life is a Barry, Billy Barry child. Do you remember them? I don't know if they're still on the go, but like it just Sorry. always seemed to me to be a fate worse than death that your mother might be like, you should be a Billy Barry child. I know, yeah, I know, I know. Like that, did I tell you, or did I mention on the podcast a while ago when I put my kids into this speech and drama class and it was, it was worked like, so they do this thing where they let them go for one week just to see if they like it. So I didn't have to pay for anything, thank God. But it was worth the hassle of getting them to it for the comedy of how much my two boys absolutely loathed, loathed. Lo- like I, oh, the, the door swung open while I was waiting outside for it to be over and the, one of them was weeping. Like just <laughs> like they were singing the Lion King or something. They came at my boys. They're like so like football and, you know, like just so into like whatever. And I was just like giving them, you know, the chance for a taste of something different. And they were furious when they came out. One of them was like, there was dancing. And then there was a few more minutes of talking. And then there was more dancing, 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 dancing. And I was like, OK, OK, you don't have to. Come. We are never coming back here. And I was like, Okay, guys, like, fair enough. So I don't, maybe my daughter, but I don't think I've got any Billy Barry kids and the two boys anyway, that's for sure. No, no, they'd probably be like me watching it tomorrow night going, God, I hope she doesn't think this is great and make me want to be one of them. All right, well, look, uh, we got some feedback on last week's podcast. As always, we'll we'll mention it. Um, a, a lot of them, a lot of them actually were positive on last week. Um, but remember we were talking last week about people saying, you know, um, which you were accused of. Um, several people wrote in to say that they have their own verbal tics. One person, it's you know what I mean. Another person, it's you know. Another person says, I'm Jonathan says, I'm defo the like guy. He says like all the time. So that, 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 um, another person, by the way, says that I am Scrooge, which, uh, is a, a label that I embrace. Aww. Yeah, that was from Ned Luby 7419. He says that I am Scrooge, which I embrace. Um, and uh, some guy called Keith Whitty Gmail says he hates the Christmas satanic vibe, which, um, well, I suppose, I don't know, that's one way of looking at it. I, I don't really feel like it's satanic, but that's your opinion. That's your opinion. Um, anyway, uh, that any, any comments that stuck with you that you want to give out about? Sorry, um A lot of people were, were keen on putting up the Christmas trees if it makes you happy. So, fair enough. Um, I'm I don't, I don't recognise my own country. Remember when I was growing up, the, the, the very idea of putting a Christmas tree up before the 8th of December would have been frowned upon, but it's just the country has changed. Anyway. Well, you know, what are you going to do? Exactly. This podcast is, of course, called The Week That Really Was, and there are people probably sitting here going, when are you going to start talking about the news? So let's start talking about the news. And I think the biggest news in the last week, Sarah, unless you disagree with me, was actually something that happened the day last week's episode was released which was when Ryan Casey, the boyfriend of the late Ashley Murphy, made his victim impact statement in the uh, in the high court ahead of the sentencing of Joseph Busca. And in that statement, um, he made several comments that were, um, I suppose if you're in the media, you might call them eyebrow raising. And if you are somebody else, you might call them common sense. Um, I certainly thought uh, it was very brave of him to say what he said. He essentially said, for the few people who haven't heard what he said, He said that Ireland is no longer the country that he and Ashley grew up in. And he questioned why somebody like Joseph Buska was able to come here from Slovakia, live for 10 years, get a five bedroom house from the taxpayer and never do a day's work in his life or contribute anything to Irish society. While um, I'm paraphrasing now, but while he and Ashley were expected to save, scrimp and save and work for everything they had. Isn't it a fair question? Yes. I think it's a fair question. And I and I I think, but you see, this is the thing, John. Like I think most questions are fair questions. It's the what I have a problem with is the fact that it's 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 ignored and it's pretended like he didn't ask the question because it doesn't suit. It was very funny the degree to which the media covered it up, and I, I, I like I, and you know sometimes you say the media covering a story up, you sound like a conspiracy theorist. There's no, no. there's no conspiracy theory here. The media covered it up. How I know for a fact that the media covered it up is that RTE ran it uh, on the lunchtime news. Um, I think uh, several news outlets reported in their morning editions. And then mysteriously, after about two o'clock on that Friday afternoon, it disappeared from almost everywhere. RTE's coverage didn't make mention of it at all. Um, I, I heard, I think it was Frank Graney, who's News Talk Court reporter, do a 20-minute review of all the victim impact statements that evening on the news. 
wasn't mentioned at all. The Irish Times was never said. Um, they covered everything else he said, but they excised that bit out. Now, that's not a coincidence. There are people in journalism who decided that the public shouldn't be allowed to hear those words because they might agree with them. But can we just say that regardless of the subject matter, and we'll get back to that in a second, is that not just outrageous? Like, can we agree that that that's really, really worrying? Like, the media don't get to decide what the public are entitled to hear. Is that is that is that far right now? Probably is. Well, that's far, well, far right disinformation because I mean, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's related, but followed on then Monday morning, we had every news outlet plaster across their pages a report claiming that disinformation and misinformation is on the rise. Bull shit, like bullshit. And I mean, we can talk about the report. I might talk about the report a little while later on, but the report itself was a load of nonsense. Um, but the irony of going on Friday, where you have deliberately by omission misinformed the public about what was said in court, to then blathering on about the, the rising threat of misinformation and alternative media outlets. We got a mention in the report, by the way, Gripped Media apparently is, they, they didn't accuse us of circulating misinformation. All they said was that we're very popular in the kind of circles where misinformation is consumed. Oh. Uh, hmm. um, like, God, grow up. Seriously. But, um, I, I thought the yeah look. It, I, I think it's just. I think it's just. Let's go back to the subject at hand, which is that this man, who planned his whole life with somebody, and like, I don't want to get. I I I, I read his full statement, and I read what his, her mother said, and everything. And honestly, I was just so upset by the whole thing. It was just so distressing. These people's lives are ruined you know there's no there's no there's no there's not going to be anything that can ever undo this there that mother you know she said this line in it and it was like you know small talk I don't care anymore you know and I just, it just really resonated with me like you know somebody murdered my daughter like who cares about small talk I don't care about talking to anybody I don't care about anything anymore my life is ruined and this guy fell in love with this girl, like two hard workers planning their life together. And for no reason that makes any sense to anybody, she's just gone in the most violent, horrific way. He can have, he can say whatever he likes in his victim impact statement, as far as I'm concerned, because this is the victim's impact, the impact on the victim. Do you know what I mean? He's a victim of this situation. He's allowed to comment on it. I think it's absolutely outrageous that what he said is just covered up. Like, who do people think they are to, to decide that his opinions on anything? And, and and what did he even say? You know well, what I mean? I, I thought the most insidious moment of the week on that, and I, I have some more to say on, on, on what you said, but the most insidious moment of the week for that for me was when, when my colleague Ben pushed the words of Brian Casey to Michal Martin. And Michal yeah. Martin's answer, I mean, uh, the substance of his answer was was bollocks. I mean, he talked about how it was, people have various entitlements. But that wasn't the insidious thing. The insidious thing was when he started saying how he understood that Ryan Casey had been through terrible trauma and all the rest of it. Which to me, and maybe Michal didn't intend it this way, but I have my it sounded to me like he did. Uh, it sounds to me like saying, oh well obviously he's under huge stress and he's very upset and you know, maybe we shouldn't be talking about what he said. There was that, there was that kind of hint of mm -hmm. That's what I got from what Michal said. Now, maybe he didn't mean it that way, but it sounded that way to me. And I think there was a degree of that in the media's decision to hide it from the public. The rationalization for it would have been that, oh, he's very upset and he's not thinking clearly because he's lost a loved one. And, you know, he'll just be made a, he'll just be made a spokesperson for the hate of far right. But you know what's astonishing is the contrast between that, where here's Ryan Casey blaming government policy essentially or saying government policy had a role in Joseph Puska being here and taking away the love of his life, and that can't be covered. And then if you think about the coverage of the Savita Halepin Aver case, where mm. her husband said, Irish policy in relation to abortion um, contributed to my wife's death, it should be changed. And, I mean, there were journalists outside putting up shrines to her for the, the purpose of getting Irish law changed. So, I mean, your blatant hypocrisy, lads, is, is you know, it, it can't be missed. Um, but but it's right. also, it's also, I mean, 
it's it's there's also another element to it which is and i remember at the time being kind of you know before anybody knew what had happened with ashing murphy there was all this out i saw it all over my social media i remember you know um caught like the it was about you know irish men and the irish mammy and whose fault it is and was you know uh, the, I'm not going to actually name a journalist because I might get it wrong but there was definitely an article about how the Irish mammy had contributed to you know men's you know contempt and, and violence against women in Ireland and call your uncles and your male relatives and tell them to stop being violent to women and and all these women that I know some of whom actually I took it up with at the time I remember putting up on their social media like I'm going to raise my son you know not to not to murder and not to be abusive to women sorry hold on a second Hold on a second. I, nobody had to teach my male relatives who are adults not to murder women. It's so unbelievably offensive. Do you know what I mean? It's like, yeah. oh, it's the Irish mammy's fault and we coddle the men too much and they treat women like whatever. Stop for a second and have a word with yourself. We don't have to teach men not to murder women. There are things Irish mammies can be blamed for. They can be blamed for the fact that many of them... We, we actually have had a conversation we, about we had, before, we came, before we came on air, we were talking about <laughs> talking about my similarities with Sarah's beloved husband. Uh, and how like, we blame your mothers for it. Yeah, yes, there are, there are issues. I mean, uh, you know, I, I think I'm not, I'm not going to calumnize or embarrass uh, your husband when I say that he shares with me a, a relative inability to do ironing or locate some cleaning products in the house from time to time. Uh, yeah. We can blame Irish mammies for that. But yeah, I mean, it, it was just another example. Like, there's one permitted narrative in this country. So you could, if, 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 if when a woman is murdered, journalists who never knew her are permitted to blame Irish mammies. But her boyfriend who loved her, I mean, can I just say a few words about Ryan Casey here? Because um, I think as a man, he, talking about providing a good example, here is somebody know, who, who has know. been absolutely devoted to Ashling's memory. The most, the most, haunting part of his statement for me was when he was talking about the life they were planning together because I mean as 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 a husband myself and somebody who who is married to somebody I love that that for me is the is is the thing that keeps you going it's the what will we do next summer how will we improve the house next um where are we going on our next holiday what's the next memory I'd like like us to make together um all of that's been taken from it um, and he has provided an example of dignity and steadfastness. And he, when he said that he had a, a little shrine to her in his, his bedroom, like it broke me. I know. Because it, it, it broke me. Um, I, and I'm not somebody who's easily broken. I'm not, uh, from all my sins, a very, a person who gets emotional easily. Um, but that, that hit me right in the ghoulies, to be honest. Mm. Um, so I, I, I like, but he can't say what he wants to say but some clown who's been to the DCU madrasa of journalism for four years can come out and say Irish mammy whatever they want yeah I mean come on yeah come on we have some bloody shame yeah. I mean it's not it's not it's not it's, it's not hard to feel a little bit of shame and embarrassment but there yeah. you go that's that's where we're at on that one um but you know the good news is I think um Ben Scallon's video was, was viewed four million times. Um, now, I, wow. I part of that I think was Conor McGregor. Conor McGregor, by the way, it, uh, I know it wasn't on our schedule of things to talk about. Conor McGregor seems to have been really radicalized recently. Um, so, uh, I'm, yeah, I'm kind of in two minds about this, right? Because <laughs> <laughs> because it's uh, talk about Sophie's choice here. Um, not really a fan um, most of the time. And I think that he, I was looking at his tweets yesterday or whatever, and it's, it's, it, some of it is a little bit incoherent, but it, it, he's, he's, he, I think that he has a fan base and I think that he's using his platform to demonstrate a frustration that exists that is real in Irish society. Yeah, I, I, I share your views. I mean, I would say about Conor McGregor, and he, by the way, he retweeted one of my articles yesterday. So I'm not. I as far as, he's a good you lad. Made it, John. Uh, you he's, made a, it. he's a he's a he's a good lad, and I won't hear a word said against him. <laughs> but I think it's fair to say that uh, I would not always have been a fan of his conduct or how he conducted himself. And I mean, sometimes you know, you know, wouldn't always have regarded Conor McGregor with uh, with with 
warmth. And there's still, I, still, I wouldn't say he has even 20% of the answers that the country needs. But what he has is a voice and the courage to use it. And I think he should be commended for that because he's identifying, he's speaking out and he's saying what a lot of people are afraid to say. So more of that. And he's also uncancelable, like, let's be honest, because he doesn't care and he's got loads of money. And was, The thing about Conor McGregor is, I remember a couple of weeks ago I was telling you I was in Italy. Mm. Um, like, and I was sitting in, uh, first night we were in Italy, I was sitting at a restaurant in, in Rome, just near the Piazza Navona, and the, the waiter was practicing his English and he asked where we were from and he said Ireland. And we said Ireland. And the first thing he said was, oh, Conor McGregor. Oh, yeah. And anytime I'm in the US, like anytime I'm in the US, um, when I say I'm from Ireland, 95% of the time, and that's not an exaggeration, like literally 19 out of 20 times, the first thing somebody will say to me is, oh, Conor McGregor. I mean, in this country, we underestimate the sheer For scale sure. of his global fame and fan base. Yeah. I mean, when I, think, I was traveling around Asia years and years ago, it used to be Roy Keane. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, he's very, very, very popular in America. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, there's like, it, 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 kudos to him. But, uh, you know, he has he has a huge platform and he's he's using it to say things that uh, other people with similar platforms or much smaller platforms are afraid to say. So uh, more power to him. As far as and I also the thing is that, like, as we've discussed before, when you basically through through, you know, and we've talked before about cancellation and the process is the punishment when you make people fearful like what happened to Roisin Murphy, that singer, a while ago. When you make people fearful about speaking out, people like Conor McGregor rise to the top of of the of the kind of ranks of this kind of talking because they're the only ones who can. Yep. Like like I said, he's uncancelable because he's bigger and richer and 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 doesn't care. But you would get you you would probably get better and more coherent and you know more constructive commentary and debate from people if you allowed them to. But you don't. So what you're left with is, you know, the Donald Trumps and the and the Conor McGregor's. Well, reap what you sow. And the Javier Milais and the um, the uh, uh, Laden Holland, Gert Bilders, who nice who, segue um, there, John. Was it? I mean, I are we look. I I just think. Um, it's all it's all connected, and these 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 issues are not are not shared in Ireland alone. Geert, Geert Wilders, um, you want to talk somebody who's far right in inverted commas? Geert Wilders is about, and and I say this, some people are going to react badly. When I say this, but I'm going to say it anyway. He's about as close as you can probably get to the real deal, as in actually fringely being out there. He wants to do things that are are genuinely quite extreme, like he wants to ban the Quran. He has uh, talked oh. a lot about the is- Islamization of Europe. He wants to ban people from, he wants to ban the construction of new mosques, etc. Now, I'm not saying, I'm not saying, obviously the Dutch people have voted for it. I'm not saying it, it, they're, those are illegitimate ideas necessarily. I'm just saying they're quite, they're quite out there relative to the rest of the political spectrum. And he won a stonking great victory. Now, the Dutch electoral system, Sarah, being what it is, um, where it's a list system where you basically vote for a political party and there are like 30 of them. So no one ever wins a majority. But mm. to win, um, he basically won a full quarter of the seats. Um, and then there are other there are other parties. So like there's a new um, conservative party that would... Gerd Weiler is, by the way, if you're... I- interesting that he, he's, he's quite extreme on some stuff, but then he's actually pro-choice, for example. So so a lot of, for example, pro-life voters would have a problem with him. Um, and the 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 other conservative, the other new conservative grouping, which is actually more focused on things like abortion and euthanasia, but shares some of his concerns about immigration, it won twenty seats. So there's fifty five seats straight off the bat. Matt Tracy has a piece on this about on, on grip. Dot. You don't want to break down who won and what they stand for. But I mean, there's a real prospect of him forming uh, of Wilders being the next Dutch prime minister with uh, with a workable majority government. Lots of people as well, John, are pro-life, and they don't only vote for the. They don't only vote on. They're not a single issue voter. No, but some of our listeners uh, regard that as a as a really important issue. So I, I thought I would uh, mention it. Um, mm-hmm. The other thing with Wilders, by the way, and this is where I think it, it's really interesting, is that you would think with all the protests around Europe about the Gaza and Israel war that 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 his being as vocally pro-Israel as he is, I mean, he made it a sort of centerpiece of his campaign, would have backfired. Um, and it didn't, um, because he links he links the sort of 
Israeli issue to sort of what he sees as Islamic immigration into Europe and says, look, the Israelis live with it every day. Um, and then you've ha had all these protests in Holland, um, which have been, like many of the protests in the UK and elsewhere, have had a distinctly sort of Middle Eastern character to them. Yeah. Uh, and I think that might have helped them a little bit in sort of highlighting those issues. But it's it's some slap in the face to the European establishment for a guy like that to do as well as he did. Um, and it's a, it should be a red light flashing on the on the dashboard for the Irish government as well. Yeah, but I think that there, I was listening to the radio this morning <clears throat> and uh, Simon Harris was on and he was being asked by, on Claire Byrne, and he was asked, being asked by Claire about a variety of things. And one of which was the next general election. And, and you know, he was saying, oh, well, I, you know, I'm really looking forward to it because I think it's the first time, um, if, you know, in a long time, the Irish voters will really get a choice. And I was just like, lol. But anyway, um. It, 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 there was a kind of a I think part of the problem for us is that there is you know very few alternatives that's why last week I was saying I was excited about the new party because I like you know alternatives I like new ideas I like people who come in and change the debate and, and talk about things that actually you know in, in a way that's new and interesting and fresh and I think that the existing parties are quite jaded but we don't have yet anything to that that even covers that would would fill that kind of gap if you and, know and we also have journalists who are absolutely committed to ensuring that that, that stays that way i mean if you compare I, I yesterday i looked and the irish times had on its front page the front page story it had people before profit uh, criticizing the t-shirt for visiting israel and the middle east last week now i'm not we're not talking about whether their criticism was right or whether it was i, I don't care about that I do care that people before profit have 3% of the vote. They've had 3% of the vote in basically every opinion poll since the dawn of time. And yet they are on the front pages every other day. Uh, Independent Ireland, who launched last week, have two CDs. One might argue a real prospect of success. Haven't seen them on the front page of the Irish Times or indeed any other media outlet. Um, somebody said to me last week, we talked too much of the Irish Times. Maybe we do, but it's the so-called paper of record and it sort of sets the tone for the rest of the media. Um, Ain't to have the same number of, of votes in opinion polls as people for profit. Don't get any of that kind of coverage. Um, so, like, it's so hard even for, for a new party to get their message out. It, it's extraordinary um, the degree to which information is just tamped down and controlled ruthlessly. Um, but is it that the media also are, are, you know, or some of the media are quite lazy and they love the pantomime of the kind of mad scarf wearing? shouting and roaring and doing mad stuff like keeping politicians in their car and in a protest and all that, that they love all that drama. There's, because... a, there's a bit of that. And I also think Paul Murphy and Richard Boyd Barrett draw a disproportionate number of hate click. Are you familiar with the idea of a hate click? Say it again. They, they draw a disproportionate number of hate clicks. So yes. people, people who click them, click the story to go, not these whores again. <laughs> you know, like, you know, and it's a real, it's a real, I can tell you, it's a real phenomenon. Um, something I try to avoid doing a crypt, but like it's a real phenomenon. You, you can, like, you could. I mean, I remember a couple of years ago, um, there was a definite thing around it with um, that lady who was Lord Mayor of Dublin for a, for a moment, for a little while, Hazel Chu. Um, I noticed that any time she was in a headline, didn't matter what the story was, people would rush to click, and it was never because they liked Hazel Chu. It was just to find out what she'd said. Not, um, there's a degree mm. of that. Um, I don't have anything positive to contribute to anything about Hazel Chu, so I will remain quiet. <laughs> You're not outing yourself as a potential hate clicker, I hope, sir. Just but, irritating. Uh, yeah, I, I also have very little positive to say about Hazel Chu, but I'm using her as an example of that sort of phenomenon. There are politicians um, and people in public life who annoy people so much that covering them is actually profitable because people want to rush to comments to say something negative about them. And, the, and maybe there's an element of that with the coverage of people for profit. But it doesn't explain why um, they get, I mean, it doesn't justify it. It might explain it, but it doesn't justify it. I mean, you've got one party that's on 3% getting kind of blanket coverage, never off the TV, never off the radio. And they are, by the way, part of far right, they are the definition of far left. And mm -hmm. no one in the media ever cares at all. But yet you've got 
fairly reasonable politicians on the other on the other side of the fence with a different view can't get airtime. But it's, it's it, it, I wouldn't have as much of a problem with it, John, if there was an element where it was being used to, you know, open up discussions about broader issues about the left. My issue is that it's not for starters. It's just clickbait and just, you know, all of this, all of this for nothing. They have slightly different you know, views from the from the mainstream media and the mainstream government on a couple of issues. But ultimately, they're still towing the line on most things, let's be honest. And my issue is that all we ever hear about is the far right and the far right this and the far right that and the fear of the far right, the far right, far right, far right, and how terrifying it all is. And the far right looks like this and the far right is racist and the far right thinks that. But nobody ever has a conversation about what the extremes of the far left look like and how that might go wrong. And, you know, we could we could sit down and have an entire podcast and school people on where in history the far left have gone wrong. But hopefully people have their own ideas of that already. But there's never any conversation about what might be too far left what might be completely extreme, what might not work. It's just airtime, airtime, airtime for people, as you say, around 3% and no development or challenge of those fundamental ideas either. So we're, we're getting it the short end of the stick on both ends. Yeah. It's, it's, we have to listen to them, but we don't ever have to listen to them getting challenged. Yeah, it's bananas. And the other thing that never happens is that people will never explain to you what it is that people for profits actual policies are. Ever. It will never it will never be said. Um, so, for example, a couple of years ago, Paul Murphy launched a manifesto for a group called Rise, which is sort of his subdivision of people poor profit. Um, and like it's a, it's an astonishing document. So. It, oh, yeah. And if it was another if it was another party, it'd be gone through at a granular level. Yeah. To find that on paragraph 432, chapter chapter 17, line nine, you made a typo, whereas he could have buried within his rise manifesto a plan to a plan to build an, a, a wall around whatever. And no one would mention it. So, for example, uh, he calls for a full secular socialist constitution that enshrines human rights and abolishes the right of capitalist private property. <laughs> There's your house gone, Sarah. And mine. He wants a four-day week with, wait for this, no loss of pay, increased annual leave to 40 days per year, and two years of paid leave for parents. There's our business gone. Yep. Um, he also wants to abolish regressive taxation on workers, no carbon tax on working people, um, no broadcasting tax, no water charges, no property taxes. How is he going to pay for this? Um, I'm going to, and by the way, I'm quoting directly from his document. Uh, he wants to break with Ireland's corporate tax haven model of development by abolishing corporate tax breaks, double the corporation tax on big business, introduce a financial transactions tax, a millionaire's tax, higher income tax for those earning over 100,000 euros. But then, wait for it, after, after putting everything on um, taxing big corporations, wait for the literally the next paragraph. Nationalize the banking system and the core sectors of the economy cur currently controlled by major corporations. So the very corporations he's relying on to pay for all this nonsense, he wants to nationalize them and take them out of the for-profit sector. So how are you going to tax profits when you're nationalizing the companies and getting rid of their profits? What, I mean, could, poss what, what could possibly go wrong, John? But, but you're very negative. Is, you're very negative. This all seems fine. But I'm sorry, but the, this is the thing. I mean, and. Uh, uh, I guarantee you there are a lot of people listening to this podcast who have never actually heard what his policies are before, but he's allowed on television to advocate against why other people's policies are bad. Meanwhile, um, somebody like uh, Independent Ireland or Ain't Who comes up with a policy document in relation to something and the sky is falling in. It's far-right extremism. Oh my God, what are we going to do? Have you seen this new policy? It is, uh, the double standard is outrageous. It is shameful. It is embarrassing. And a media that engages in it has no right to the title of journalist. They, they mm -hmm. don't. And that's why I just have so much. Like, I, I logged on to TikTok this morning, Sarah. And the first thing I saw was an advert from TikTok that tells me that was basically saying, we're now working with the journal.ie to help you identify fake news and misinformation on this platform. <laughs> I mean, go and jump in a ditch. Yeah. Sorry, am I ranting a bit? No, no, I, I, I'm i just thinking about how, and having a baby is a wonderful thing, but all of that manifesto has never gotten any airtime, but Paul Murphy having a baby had days of coverage. Baby it, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So, but what you, the reason 
everything you're saying is true and everything you're saying is the reason why gripped exists it's the reason why people say and and this isn't again saying oh you know oh, oh we get all these comments or whatever but we do get a lot of comments and a lot of contact from people saying thanks for saying the things that no one else is saying gripped exists because of this point it does it does um but you know <laughs> It's but it still, can still be it, irritating. Yeah. It, it can be very frustrating. It can be very frustrating to watch something like the Ryan Casey thing last week happen in real time. And know that, you know, there's a limited amount you can do to try and correct the record for people. But you you, you, you do know that there are, there are people in this country, probably hundreds, thousands of them, who still to this day have no idea that Ryan Casey said what he said in his victim impact statement. Who would agree with it? Because they... They're older, they get their news from RTE, they, they read the Independent or the Examiner, and they get their news from local radio, which may or may not have mentioned it. Local radio can sometimes be better. But they, they just have no idea. And that is an astonishing amount of power for a group of people to have in society who nobody elected. And it is horrendous to see that power being abused in the way it is persistently abused. Yeah. That's right. It was, it was, it really, for me, took took on a life of its own during the referendum to repeal the 8th. And it was the first time I really saw just completely unbiased or biased, shameless promotion of one side over the other with a straight face. Yeah. And I remember yeah. talking to my dad about it at the time, who would have been not in agreement with me on the, on that issue. And, um, I said it's all very well now on an it when it's going in a direction that you want, but later, and by the way, he agreed with me when I was telling him um, about what I was observing. But he, I, I said it's all very well now when it's something you want, but later on, you know, the the the, the media and 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 people in so behind the scenes in social media becoming emboldened to interfere and and to push things a certain way and to you know, not not give the two sides is a is a real concern. Mm. And I and I haven't been reassured by anything I've seen. I mean that's you know, six years ago. I haven't been reassured by anything I've seen since. If anything, it's getting worse. Yeah, well it started in twenty sixteen, I think. Twenty sixteen was the sort of watershed year because the the, the the liberal order got a got an awful shock by two events that year, the Brexit referendum and the Donald Trump thing. And of course mm -hmm. if you if you follow the news and you, you notice trends in the news at all the, the, the overwhelming trend is that the that as far as the media are concerned, liberals can never lose elections because they're unpopular. That can't happen. The only way it can happen is if they A, didn't get their message out, or B, there was some kind of skullduggery. So yeah. it, uh, the, the skullduggery was that uh, the, the, the Brexit campaign used misinformation and Donald Trump used misinformation. Therefore, Ireland is vulnerable to misinformation and we must make sure it never happens again. And misinformation now has become this word that is used essentially as, which essentially means anything that might, we fear, make people think about embracing kind of Trumpy, Brexity ideas. Um, or, and, and by the way, the voting no in the abortion referendum was seen by the media as a sort of like, this would be a Brexity Trumpy moment if we if we did this. And so it must be squashed. And that's, mm -hmm. that's, that's, I, I, I promise you, if you go back, if you're interested in doing this and go back and look about uh, and look for articles in the Irish media about misinformation and disinformation before 2016, you will find none. None. Yeah, it's a it's an entirely post 2016 um, invention. Um, and a concern. And now it's an industry, um, an entirely taxpayer funded industry, and it's an industry. Um, but it's not going to work. That's what I think, because ultimately people will notice. I, I mentioned all those people who didn't hear the Ryan Casey story, but there'll be another 40, 50, 60, 70, 100,000 people who know full well what he said and notice that the media didn't cover it and start asking why. And why aren't the media covering it? What, what else aren't they covering? My, um, I was talking to uh, somebody recently who's related to me. Um, by marriage, who um, literally the Ryan Casey story was the last straw for them. They're like, I, 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 I can't trust RT anymore. That's what he said. And this is a retired person who's older. So it's happening. Yeah. Anyway, what else is happening in the world? We've been talking about the media. And well, it's else. not really, it's not really your, um, it's not really, well, I don't know, but it is my interest in um, the tech world. So the tech world for the last kind of week and a half has been 
described as the drama has been described as like an episode of succession. Well, you'd love that. I love a bit of that. So um, basically, um, you're familiar with OpenAI? I am. And um, so OpenAI was... But explain oh, for the listeners in case they don't know. What, what, what is OpenAI exactly? OpenAI is a company um, that basically developed chat GDP, GPT. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a, it began as a non-profit organization and the mission was to make sure that the development of AI general intelligence was of benefit to all humanity, hmm. which all sounds wonderful and it was amazing. But ultimately, over time, they started to um, hit some bumps in the fact that they didn't, in, in order to keep advancing the AI projects that it was working on, it needed more money to for talent and, you know, whatever, obviously. So um, around 2019, they restructured from being like a purely non-profit to being what's called a capped profit company. Um, so it now had a for-profit subsidiary, um, which was responsible for raising capital for that was required for OpenAI to continue to advance all the AI models that we now see today. So basically, and then like... It, <laughs> The, the, the not-for-profit was still going to be governed by um, the not-profit board. Um, so, like, their responsibility was to, to make the, sure that the, it kept with... The for-profit, sorry, was going to be governed by the not-for-profit. Yes, okay. sorry. And um, so it's keeping to the mission that it was sa- that AI was going to be safe and that it was going to be of benefit to everyone or whatever. So the main character in all of this was Sam Altman. Um, and Sam Altman was on the board. Um, so the board of profit and not profit was split evenly between employees. I think there was six, if memory serves. Anyway, um, basically, in a, to, to keep it short, Sam Altman was fired. Um, uh, there was all this boardroom jostling or whatever, and he was fired by the board. And really quickly, they appointed this guy called Emmett Shear and as the CEO. And then um, Microsoft, which had owned a 49% stake in the company, um, poached Altman, basically. And the the employees went absolutely mental and started signing this letter that Altman be reinstated or else they were going to leave. And um, they said they no longer had any, any confidence in the board. And um, basically, um, they didn't see why he, he's really popular with staff and they didn't see why he'd been fired and they were extremely angry or whatever. So um, basically what happened was that Sam, there was days and days and days of consternation. And basically he was then reinstated as the open AI uh, CEO Um because the staff threatened to quit en masse. And um, they had also called for the board to be, um, he, he said he wanted an explanation for why he'd been fired. They wouldn't give it or whatever. So basically the board are now, some have resigned, some haven't. It's all up in the air, but it's been like unbelievably, unbelievably dramatic and days of people on Bloomberg saying they're doing this, saying they're doing that. And um um, so basically, the fallout and the impact of the progress uh, of the pro- of this on progress of the company is kind of remains to be seen. But it's been massively exciting, John. You missed out. <laughs> I hope I I hope I explained that well. There, it's it was like day by day. It was it was um, changing and 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 happening and then not happening and then you know boards in boards out or whatever. So sounds very. A like, sounds a bit like I'm a celebrity. Get me out of here for nerds. Kind of, yeah, yeah. exactly. But um, I, I love open, like I love chat GPT. Like I use it for, I didn't actually understand how to use it. And my sister was a, is a big fan. And I started using it when I went to Boston a few weeks ago and just had it on my phone. And we wanted, to, we were only in Boston for a few days and we wanted to do a lot of different things. So I put into chat GPT um, write an itinerary for a three day trip three full day trip in boston for two girls who want to do this 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 and this eat in this restaurant go to this shop and do this and do that and it basically just does out the entire itinerary putting the restaurants that you want to go close to the activities if you know what i mean mm-hmm. so that it all kind of works i couldn't believe it and then recently i've been writing things and 
you know, you put into it, summarize the following document, copy and paste the whole document in, read the summary. Amazing, 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 amazing. Some of the stuff, I mean, Ben Scallon was showing me last week um, and he's been, <laughs> he's been, he, he can't wait for an opportunity to use this. But he was showing me an AI program, which and it, it really is astonishing what it does. Um, I don't think it's an open AI program. I'm not sure who developed it, so I'm, I can't advertise it. Um, but you can feel free to, if you're listening to this and you want to know about it, feel free to tweet Ben. I'm sure he'll share it with you. Basically what it does is, if I'm giving a speech in English on videotape, it will take that video and using my actual voice, uh, it'll change my lip movements and translate me directly into French or German or Italian or anything. No or, way. Or any other language while keeping the speech and my voice the exact same. And he was showing me this video of, I think it was uh, the Brazilian president, Lula, um, giving a speech and he was giving it in perfect English. It, it translated something Netanyahu had said into Hebrew, into perfect English. Uh, Macron bad. shot. Like, and... and um, which obviously has enormous potential from a sort of speed of, the, you know, creating a, you know, in Star Trek, where they, they get around the problem of like traveling throughout her space and meeting all these like other species and everyone speaks English. And the way they explain that is that there's this button everyone wears called a universal translator. This is as close as I've ever seen to that being in real life, because you literally just run some of these speech through videos, they translate it into English and it comes out in perfect English. Um, or if you're Chinese, perfect Chinese. Um, so the potential for AI is almost limitless. But your job as an interpreter is gone. That would be terrible for all the Connor and the Gaelga people who've got all those jobs in Brussels translating everything that's said in the European <laughs> Parliament into Irish. Mm. Um, mm, that uh, sounds sarcastic, John. Um, not at all. It's a great example of, of how to get, how to make, uh, look, I, I, I if that anyone thinks that makes me sound anti-Irish language, I am not anti-Irish language. I, I actually, I actually think it uh, it'll be it'll be good in a way for people who want to communicate and receive their news through Irish. Because I don't know if Irish language is available on that AI program yet, but I'm sure it will be. And if you want to listen to Vladimir Putin um, talking about nuking America, three van the Gaelga, then you'll be able to do it. That's um, nice. No, it's amazing though. It's it, but the only thing is that it. I have this weird thing where it's. I'm asking you to do things and I and it's I'm so amazed by what it's done and so grateful because it's saved me so much time that I I keep doing this thing where I'm like, oh, th writing in. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And I'm like, you know, this isn't real. Like, it feels like you ought to thank this non-human mm. thing. You there, know? Are, there are already cases now because, you know, Americans are weird. <laughs> there are already cases of Americans falling in love and trying to marry AI, God. you know. Creating well, John, you know, if AI figures out how to clean bathrooms and iron its own clothes and wash its own clothes, I may follow them. <laughs> oh, the poor Irish mammy. It is yeah, fascinating, Irish. you know, it is fascinating because we were having that conversation. It's one we should have on the podcast at some stage. My mother, who I love very dearly, I mean, and, and she would say herself that she ruined, she ruined me like she... I, I was saying to you before we came on air that when I was growing up, like as there were three boys in our house and the dinner we put on the table and you'd eat the dinner and then you'd run off outside to do something and just leave the plates and the glass of wine and then they'd be gone. Which uh, I find absolutely fascinating. Yeah. Um, and, and you were saying that, that, that uh, Keith was the same in, in yeah. his house. Yeah. Uh, like, so the, there is definitely, it drives my wife batty. The other thing I do is I put like, I, I, well, I say I do it. I don't do it because I'd be shot if I still did it. But apparently, like, I, I always have a habit of putting my glasses on the sink, not in the sink. I don't know why that is. It makes no sense when you think about it out loud, but it's just something that, that my whole life I've or been Or wash it. How about that? No, don't go too far, sir. But um, no, you're right. You're right. No, no, I, no, it's, it's like, the thing is, it is, and, and what I find, there is there is a definite disparity between the genders most of the time on this issue. And I find when I was growing up, I knew how to make a full Sunday dinner by the time I was 12. You know, I was able to cook. I was able to make meals. I was able to, to clean and whatever. And I think a lot of men just that wasn't considered to be as important when they were growing up by their mother. And so what it feels like to me is it feels like and, and Keith is 10 years older than me. So, uh, you know, I met him when he was 40 and I was 30. And I feel like 
I, you know, adopted a dog that had multiple previous owners that I expected to teach it not to shit on the rug, but actually hadn't. And now I have to train this beast. (laughs) Do you not think, in fairness to us, that there is also like a psychological... I hope he doesn't listen to this particular episode. (laughs) Well, I'm going to defend him because I, I think I think there's a. a of course a, you are. Of course I, you are. I, I think there's a fundamental difference between men and women on this stuff. I mean, I'm I'm sitting in my living room chatting to you at the moment, and I'm looking across at our our TV stand, and underneath the TV stand, I can see a single lone popcorn kernel. I don't know how it got over there. I presume the dog threw it over there or something. And and there it's fine. Whereas if, if my wife is home, she'd be like straight over to get that and clean it up. Whereas I'm like, no, oh, it's not doing me any harm. You know, like there's a difference between yeah. how, how men and women perceive or tolerate. Yeah. Like Keith will always say to me, like he, he, he'll say, you know, say if it's Saturday, he'll say, well, look, can we not just sit down and just chill, watch some, you know, watch some TV or, you know, just chill out for a while. I can't chill out in a dirty house. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. have to clean the house and then I can chill. I can't just sit there and go, oh, I'll be sitting there looking at that popcorn kernel, just thinking, how long do I have to sit here and play, do this charade of relaxing before I can get up and clean that? Yeah. And I think every, every, I'm sure there are couples out there that there are, are the exception. And, you know, I've, I've encountered over the years sort of men who are obsessive about cleanliness and, uh, you know, who, who drive their wives batty in the opposite way. But I think every couple that I know, it's the same sort of pattern. So it must be, it must be. It must be to some extent gender based or parenting based. Um, I suspect parenting plays a strong role in it. I think boys are parented a little bit differently, or maybe well, not, maybe not anymore. But but in in our generation, they may. Have been. Well, I give the boys jobs, and they have to bring their plates away from the dinner or whatever from the table, and I don't want a woman to feel furious at me. 20 or 30 years from now. Well, the, other, the other thing is, the other thing is you obviously have boys and a girl. So like you, you, the last thing you want to do is make difference in them. Whereas of course, I, but I, I have to say, John, and, and, and I have to say, and I, I hate to say it, but one thing I have noticed and they say that gender is a social construct and, you know, I laugh. She is just much more than they ever were kind of like picking things up and putting things away and busying around and tidying up. <laughs> gas isn't it this and child is yet to reach two years of age i know but she kind of picks things up and i i i you know i'd say to her oh look at that now and she picked things up and put them in the bin with dire consequences and at times but <laughs> um it, there is t- definitely a difference there she's just much more busy around the place yeah i do i see i i do know some people who, who grew up i grew up in the house with all boys as i think did keith your husband mm-hmm. and um my my wife Warla grew up in a house with all girls, but I know people from. I've had this said to me by a couple of people who grew up in mixed households where there were boys and girls who've told me horror stories about how basically the boys were not expected to do any of that stuff, and the girls were effectively turned into housemaids for their own brothers. Not not in that kind of like abusive way, but that's just the the way they were parented, uh, which I think sounds horrifying. Um, but others like basically every neat man I know um, grew up with sisters. Um, so maybe, yeah. maybe, maybe I, I, I think having sister, I, I, I always have had this theory that I can, I can usually tell when a man has no sisters in it for a variety of reasons. I really wanted my boys to have a sister. Hmm. Um, I think it kind of softens you a bit. Um, but really? yeah, that's yeah. an interesting, that's an interesting one. I mean, I, 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 um, I definitely, I felt it when I was younger. I mean, I suppose when I was sort of like. 16, 17, 18, um, and girls were this kind of foreign species that you had to try and bridge a gap to because you were like, all of a sudden, they're not the enemy. They're actually quite interesting, and I might want to talk to them. Um, <laughs> there's, it, it, I had no frame of reference at that stage, and I had to learn it all myself. And and I, I think at that point, you know, having a sister might have normalized the female species a bit for me. And so Because obviously I went to all boys primary and all boys secondary school. So like, basically... It was definitely sort of 18, 19 before I ever had like a female friend. Um, yeah, and I think is, that that makes girls seem like they're kind of aliens. Whereas if yes. you'd have sisters, I don't think that that would have applied. Yeah, and you're also, right. it's not just about having a sister. It's also about then consequently being exposed to your sister's friends. Hmm. So one sister isn't one girl, it's 10. Yeah. So yeah, it was really annoying for me growing up with one brother because he cleaned up 
that's all I'll say on that matter, but it's very annoying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Definitely an advantage in all sorts of ways that yeah. won't be relevant for your kids for a couple of decades yet. But um but say Livy. And all right. I think we leave it there for this week. Uh, been a pleasure as always talking to you, Sarah. Um, as ever, if you're listening to this and you have comments on anything we've been saying, do send them in. We try and weed out a fair selection of them. If you feel like you something really important and we're not addressing it, uh, let me know. Um, but other than that, we will chat to you again next week for another edition of The Week That Really Was. Thanks a million.